Hey y'all, these are the Wix, the Wick, the week six problems. So I started off by actually di diagramming out examples of epistasis, and I did so by looking at flowcharts of converting like substrate one to substrate two to substrate three, but we did this in several ways. We had what we called the dominant epistasis. This is the one that gave you a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. We had the recessive epistasis, which is a 9 to 3 to 4. And then we had complementary action, which is a 9 to 7. In both of these processes, we need to have two functioning enzymes from two functioning genes. The catch is I'm doing this as like a very simple explanation of something involving color. It does not necessarily need to follow this pattern, but it's going to be the easiest for us to envision. So I'm going to do complementary action first because it's the easiest to think of. So if you have these two substrates that are colorless, and then we have this final product which is colored, well obviously if I have a recessive enzyme, or a, two recessive alleles for gene B, which codes for enzyme B, the result is going to be colorless. And it does not matter what's going on with A. If I turn out to have two recessive alleles for enzyme A, I'm going to be colorless regardless of whatever's going on with enzyme B. So the result will be there are seven different combinations of little A's and little B's that result in being colorless. So if you were to sit there and fill out a Punnett square because you wanted to sit there and Try this out by hand because you don't trust the probabilities. So if you were to sit there and take big A, big B, big A, little B, little A, big B, little B, A, little B, and fill in a Punnett square for this, what you would find out is seven of those 16 squares will either have two little A's or two little B's, or both. And this is referred to as complementary action because this is the basis of the complementation test. Recessive epistasis is a similar idea, but rather than dealing with colorless, colorless, colored, let's deal with three different colors, let's say. So we'll have color one, color two, and color three. In order for us to get all the way to color three, I need to have a functioning A and a functioning B. And it turns out that there are nine ways to reach this goal. If I, however, happen to have no functioning B, the result is I'm stuck here at color two. And there turn out to be three different combinations that result in that. That are, I still have big A, but oops, the little bees aren't going to function. What we happen to have here is dealing with little a, little a, and it turns out that if I don't have little a, I can't ever reach color number two. So the lack of enzyme A results in I will never reach color two. So this one says never reach color 2. Well, how many ways can that happen? There turn out to be four different ways to do that. So no matter what, whether it's little a, little a, little b, little b, you're stuck at color 1. Little a, little a, big b, little b, you're stuck at color 1. Little a, little a, little b, big b, you're stuck at color 1. Little a, little a, big b, big b, you're still stuck at color number 1. That's why the recessive causes the trouble. 
it's kind of the opposite when we deal with the dominant. So with dominant epistasis, obviously, so if we have color 1, color 2, color 3, Obviously, big, as long as you have a big A and a big B, you're going to reach color number three, and there are nine ways that I can do that. If, however, I knock out enzyme B, I'm stuck at color three, or excuse me, color number two, and there's three options to reach here. So big A, I don't know, little B, little B. There's three ways to do that. If, however, I happen to be this one, where it's two little A's, oh, unfortunately the iPad is doing its nasty trick on me, where these ones here, as long as I have a capital B present, if this capital B allele is present, that enzyme, that one functional copy is present, it can bypass. Capital B can bypass. And thus the dominant form, this dominant enzyme, can cause a bypass and suddenly I have lost three color one choices. And they bypass from color one to color two and it jumps straight to color three. So in reality, I really need to have color, I need B to reach ends, or to reach color three. I need co enzyme A to reach color two. But if I just have B, I can jump all the way to the end. Then obviously to have color one, you need to be just totally shut down. So in this case, B is essential to reaching the final color, A gets you halfway. And then obviously the double recessive, it doesn't matter. But it's the dominant that triggers this response. And these are the interactions that I cared for you to know. We then worked a series of problems. Um, this one here turns out to be a twofer. So it's an allelic series along with epistasis. So if we look at these ones here, what we turn out to have is sun red, corn, cross a purple, and I get nothing but sun red. What this tells me is sun red trumps purple. Orange cross sun red, I get nothing but sun red. That tells me that sun red trumps orange. So what about purple and orange together? Haha, -ha, let's do that cross, purple cross orange. I get nothing but orange. That tells me orange is more dominant than purple. So all together, I get an allelic series, which is sun red is the most dominant, followed by orange, followed by purple. Most dominant to least dominant. So that's useful to know. So we can provide that explanation. That explains crosses 1, 2, and 3. We just need to provide some symbols. We then look at cross number 4, which is orange and scarlet. We haven't met scarlet yet. But when I cross orange and scarlet, I don't get orange and I don't get scarlet. I get yellow. So what's this? This then leads to an 182 to 80 to 58 ratio. And that's a, wait, what? That doesn't look like a 9331 or something like that. Oh, you know what this is? This must be a modified 9331. This is an epistatic problem. So what do we have? We have 9331. <clears throat> and we can make different combos. I can do like a 96 to 1. I could do a 12 to 3 to 1. I could do a 9, 3, 4. I could do a 15 to 1. I can do a 13 to 3. Where all I'm doing is I'm just mixing and matching how I'm adding up the 9, the 3, the 3, and the 1. And by mixing and matching, I can come up with different combinations. Well, which one does this look most look like? If I were to go through and divide all these by 16, 
because it all adds up to being out of 16, what you would see is it is closest to a 9 to 4 to 3. Wait, 9 to 4 to 3, but over here it says 9 to 3 to 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because the 3 and the 1 next to each other, we add those up. But it's arbitrary which 3 goes where. So 9 to 4 to 3? Okay, this is recessive epistasis. We just drew this. So that means that yellow is big A, little a, big B, little b, cross big A, little a, big B, little b. Which also means that this cross here is probably something like a little a, little a, big B, big B, cross big A, big A, little b, little b. Interesting. The four, if you remember from what we drew before, the four had reference to the A, so the first thing that we wrote. In reality, it doesn't matter, but let's run with the same story. So I'm going to use this combo here to say this is my orange, which means this combo here will be my scarlet. Because again, I'm just using the same pattern I did here. So when I do that, the catch becomes, wait a second, um, orange is part of this allelic series, which means I need to label where it's orange. And the orange probably has something to do with the recessives. So if I wanted to label these as orange, I'd probably use a, I don't know, an O. So I'd probably put a superscript O there. So if I were to look at my allelic series, I would say that SR was probably A, SR, O would be the A, O, and then the purple would be A, P. Scarlet, I wasn't shown that it does anything else, so I'm just going to leave it at low Bs. So what's my pattern? What do I get from here? I get this. I have nine of these. And this is going to be something, then be something. And all these are yellow. For my three, which is my scarlet, I have big A, something, little b, little b. This is three, and this is scarlet. I don't know why I can't spell the word scarlet. I also don't know why I wrote big A that twice. Let's compact this up. No editing. For the last one, what I need to have is a combination of little a, little a, big B, I don't know. But this is orange, so I'm going to put an O there. And then I know it's also little a, little a, little b, little b. Right here, it's a combination of four. And this is my orange. Yay! This one was an allelic series, and it turned out to be epi or epistasis. So let's look at a lethal allele. This one is also a twofer. This is a lethal allele, and it's sex-linked. So, fun. You've been given a virgin Drosophila female. You notice that the bristles on the thorax are much shorter than normal, SB. You mate her with a normal male and obtain the F1 progeny, which is a third female, a third female, a third male. Huh. We are dealing with thirds. Because we have thirds here, that is a giveaway that we are dealing with lethal alleles. And if you recall, the phenotype of lethal alleles, meaning the non-lethal part, are normally dominant. So what that's telling me is the short is probably dominant to the normal. If I attempt to recreate this, that the, those offspring in terms of a Punnett square, because sometimes Punnett squares are useful when we need, need to recreate stuff, 
I'm going to have short bristles with a female. I get normal bristles, which I'm going to put as a little ask to say that's recessive, with females. I get normal bristles with males, but there's nothing in that last box. Because sex is playing a role in this, this is clearly going to be sex-linked. And since we're dealing with Drosophila, Drosophila are XY. So I'm going to have a Y chromosome here, an X chromosome here, X and X. So we're not really being told much else going on, but since it's lethal allele, we can start to take some liberties because I've already recognized what this is. So for the male, we were told that the male is sh has normal bristles. So I'm going to write that as a lowercase s. And the female has the short bristles, which is the dominant one. So I'm going to write that as a big S. But I know from lethal alleles that usually they show up and they're heterozygous. So let's actually make that so the combo makes sense. Um, and in order for that to make sense, I'm going to do a little bit of strategic rearrangement. And this is going to be a little s and a male, and this is a nothing. So if I were to fill in this Punnett square using the x's and the y's, it would actually look like this. So I wasn't consistent with like what went where, so that's on me. So we made took account of this one, which is right there, so clearly flip those. Although Yeah, then I need to flip this back. Then we can also take account of these females who are right here. I can take account of these males, which means what's going on with these ones. These are the dead ones. Provide a genetic hypothesis for the account of all these results showing genotypes of every cross. So what can we say? The P generation is going to be a male cross a heterozygous female. For the F1, I'm going to get all the progeny that I showed you, which was little, uh, the recessive female, the, the heterozygous female, and then we get the recessive male. We're also told that you cross an, a, a F1 female with a, with a brother to only give you the wild type. Is that how we would expect this to be? Well, if I were to take the normal female, who is the one in yellow, so if I take this one, cross the male, only thing you could get would be normal, so hooray, that's correct. So that one checks out. You cross the short female with the male, And it turns out you get the exact same results that you had before that I put in colors. So explain what's going on. Clearly we're dealing with the lethal allele. That manifests in males. Since they are hemizygous. Because they only have half of the chromosomes in this particular case of X's and Y's. Complementation requires us to pay attention to traits. So when we have complementation, what this tells me is the two individuals do not share the same mutation.
and thus will give you a wild type phenotype. So if there is no complementation, what this tells me is there's no wild type phenotype. What this also means is they have the same mutated gene. Maybe it's done in a different way, but it turns out to be the same. That is why if you look at like one cross one, of course it's going to give you the mutant allele because it's the same organism. So what I want to do is look for in this matrix, where do I happen to have these not complementary pairs? So if I look along each row, I see one with four, two with three, two with six, three with six, and that's it. So let's write down these pairs. So one is paired up with four, two is paired up with three and six, three is paired up with six. This is consistent with what I've seen before. And there's one that I never mentioned, which is five. So what do we have? We actually have one potential gene. All of this is the same stuff, so it's two potential genes. Then five on its own is three potential genes. This is a three gene system. We are asked how many genes result in the Wiggler phenotype and which Wiggler mutants are due to mutants in each of these genes. First gene, it's one and four. Second gene, it's two, three, and six. Third gene, it's number five. Doesn't mean that that's the order they go in, but it's the order in which we're going to list them. Here's another epistasis problem. So pure breeding strain of squash that produces disc-shaped fruits was crossed with pure breeding strain of long fruits. So we have, so we are taking disc, and we're crossing it with long, and what we're getting is all disc-shaped fruits. I'm going to allow it to self-cross, and then I'm going to get long, sphere, and disc. Interesting. I get 32 long, 178 sphere, and 270 disc. The question then becomes, so what's causing this? If I go through and divide through by... 16, what I'm going to get is approximately 1 to 6 to 9. This is actually a sign of redundant genes. So we have redundant genes. So the genes that are responsible for sphere double up. So if I go from 1 to 2 to 3... A and B turn out to do kind of like the same thing. And I only get to 2 if I have like a hiccup. So actually a better way to draw this would be kind of like this. A and B. But if I turn out to hiccup one of them, it kind of falls short. And it lands you on option number 2, which in this case is a sphere. So how would I show this? Well, clearly I'm getting a modified 9331. So disc, this one here has to be a big A, little A, big B, little B, because that's the only way I get a modified 9331. So I need to come up with, well, how can I get disc and long, and how can I make this combo happen? Well, the easiest thing to do, so to go from 1 all the way to 3, what I need to have is all dominant phenotypes. So that could be big A, big A, big B, big B. Why would I say that? Because we're being told it's true breeding. So we can call this disc. Then for the long, I can have it be little A, little A, little B, little B. That would also work. 
And when I cross these two, I would get these combos. And what do we turn out to get? We get a whole bunch of big A, big B combos, nine of them. We only get one version of the double recessive. But in between, where I have either B being kind of knocked out or A being somewhat knocked out, we uh, show up in the middle. So this would be our P generation, our F1, our F2. Up here would be disk. Then in the middle we'd have sphere. Then we'd have long. So for this one here, snapdragon plants bred true with white petals that cross the plant with that bred true for solid purple. All the F1 had white petals. Okay, so we'd write that down. White cross solid purple. Gave nothing but white. We self-cross that one, P, F, 1. What we turn out to get are 240 white, 61 solid purple, and then 19 spotted purple. Uh, figure it out. Well, if I were to take this 240, 61, and 19, if I were to divide like everything by this 19, you'd see like a 1 to 3 to like 12. So is there a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio? The answer is, sure there is. It's the dominant epistasis. So dominant epistasis, this white one here, has to be big A, big B, actually in particular big A, little A, big B, little B, has to be heter double heterozygote. For... Dominant epistasis to work, if we were to go back a few of these, in order for, do for dominant epistasis to work, the way I drew out mine, it said that one of those alleles must be dominant, and it's the dominant that is essential for the final product. That's what gives you the 12. So in reality, like that one I use B, but it doesn't matter which one you pick. So for the white... Because I'm told that they breed true, so I need to make this. It's homozygous for one trait, or one gene, homozygous for the other. Let's make A the essential. So A is the essential. In order to make this work. So that means the solid purple must be little a, little a, big B, big B. The reason why you need this combo is when you cross these two, meaning this one and this one, that will give you this combo. And if you're not sure, when in doubt, write out the Punnett square and you'll see that, yes, indeed, it works. So, this one here gets crossed, and what do we get? We get a big A and a big B. I don't know what comes next with those, but it doesn't matter. I can have a big A, little b, little b, little a, little a, big b, and then something else. Little a, little a, little b, little b. I know from what I wrote out that as long as I have a capital A, I have the dominant allele for gene A, I get to have the white phenotype. So this is 9 plus 3, which is 12. This gives you white. From here... The solid purple, I know if I have a capital B, I have that dominant allele, I get three for solid purple. Then if I'm double recessive, there's only one uh, out of 16 chance of that one, and that's going to get you your spotted purple. The solid F2 from the previous slide was crossed with a solid purple F2 plant, and these were their progeny. So that you get 50% white, 25% purple, 25% spotted purple. What are the genotypes of the F2 plants? Okay, so I got half white, half solid purple, or 25% solid purple. then a quarter spotted purple. 
I'm for the most part not a fan of Punnett squares, but when we have to work backwards, they actually somewhat become useful. Because I'm dealing with quarters, that's going to greatly simplify this thing. Because I know to get spotted purple, and I'm going to use two different colors for this one. Spotted purple is the double recessive. So I can go little a, little a, little b, little b, which means this little b, these two little b's came from up top. Or, excuse me, let me actually make this so it is being correct in how it's being drawn or written. Because an A and a B have to travel together, so what I'm going to do is take these two and put them up top, which means they'd also travel down this way. I can then take these little A and B and put it over here on the side, so I can also fill in this next spot over. So I need to have a white and a solid purple. So white, if you recall, requires a big A and that's it. Then it doesn't matter what's going on with the Bs. To get a solid purple, it was little a, little a, then you needed a capital B somewhere in there. As long as you have that. Well, if I'm getting some solid purples, what that's telling me is somewhere I need to have a capital B show up. Okay, so I need to also have as one of my options, little a and big B. So if I were to have this, then fill it in. I could go little a, big B, little a, big B. And in order to get the white, what I need to have is at least a dominant A, and then it doesn't really matter what shows up next. With one except, uh, actually, it doesn't really matter what comes next. So if I drop this down, big A, big A, then something shows up here, something shows up here. What do I get? Well, it turns out this one here is going to be white. This one here is white. Yay, I got 50%, 50%. This one here has a capital B, so that's going to be my solid purple. And then this last one is going to be my spotted purple. I probably should have used different colors for that, but oh well. So what do we know for the genotypes of the F2 plants? I crossed homozygous recessive for gene A, heterozygous for gene B, so this is my solid purple. For my white, I'm going to cross it with big A, little a, little b, then it doesn't quite matter. This one here is the white. So in reality, I actually have some choices. This could actually be big A, little a, big B, little b, big A, little a, little b, little b, and those are actually the only choices I really get. So it's going to be one of those two. But unfortunately, because of the way the dominant epistasis works, we won't be able to figure out the difference between the two because the two that give you the white color will look the same regardless of what you're doing with gene B. So we have to list both choices. Last one is a sex linkage problem. So in chickens, so, ah, oh, chickens. Chickens are ZW, so the beak color is controlled by a sex-linked gene. Dark beaks are dominant to light beaks, so Z dark is dominant to Z light. A female with a dark beak, so that would be, oh, nope, this, so this is a female with dark is mate is crossed with a male with a light beak. So light is recessive, so it has to be like this. So this is a male light. So this is my P generation. In my F1, 
The females have light beaks and the males have dark beaks. So the male will turn out to be this, and the females will turn out to be this. So this would be a dark male, and this is a light female. So how could I show you that, that turns out to be the case? Well, for those of you who can't see it, let's do it as a Punnett square. The male only contributes z with the lowercase d, but there's two of them. There's no point being redundant, so I'm only going to list it once. The female contributes either the dominant allele on the z chromosome, or it contributes a w chromosome. When I fill this in, I get zw, or capital D, lowercase d, or I get lowercase d, w. This one here would be a dark male. This one here would be a light female, which is exactly what I drew before. So we have explained this using symbols. Uh, also, genotypes and phenotypes, if you were to do an F2, aha, well, that's a different story. So let's do the F2. So if I wanted to do the F2, I would cross the heterozygous male with the hemizygous female. So if I were to do this, what can I do without making a Punnett square? I'm going to combine the first two. So that'll be option number one. I can have heterozygous male. So this would be dark male. Option number two. So this is one. Here's two. I can combine and have the light allele with the W, which would be a light female. Option number three is I can take the light or combine the two that I'm highlighting over. So I could have the light with the light. This will get me a light male. The other thing I could potentially do is I can combine the first and the last. I could probably just highlight these two, but I'm not going to, which will end up getting you a dark female. four different ways or four different combinations as a result of this. You could also show this in a Punnett square and you'd get the exact same response. Those were the problems that we worked or attempted to work. We'll be doing even more next week.